Okay, um, so they're seeing the yeah, theme. So Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to our fourth TWED and probably the eighth uh, Wednesday evening talk uh, in combination with IDEA and our pirates of the spring 2019 uh, term. Uh, today, uh, Jim McCusker is going to shake the world with his views on um, whether you should create a property or not. Um, for everybody in uh, the room, we are uh, streaming live and recording. Uh, we actually are, we understand that there's an audience out there and hopefully theoretically. Yeah. Uh, theoretically. <laughs> uh, uh, so, um, so Jim actually wants a conversation to happen tonight or a discussion. Um, uh, yelling is permitted uh, if you have strong views. But um, throwing things is not. But, right. but this is, um, there's some uh, really key questions that Jim hopes to, uh, to set the context for and then discuss about uh, whether Eugene should actually create that predicate. Or yeah, not. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, I'll leave it to Jim. Thank okay, you. and so if you're watching online and uh, or if you're in the room and you're feeling shy and don't want to yell out any questions, uh, feel free to post them in the general channel in our um, the Tetherless World Slack if you have access. Uh, and email John if you don't, and he'll let me know <laughs> the, the, what the questions are. Um, <clears throat> assuming you know who John is, he's the guy that's just up here. Uh, so anyway. Right, so uh, careful with that predicate, Eugene. Um, so I've been doing a lot of uh, data modeling lately and trying to understand how to uh, kind of uh, shape data and knowledge information in a way that is generally useful to, uh, to kind of solve scientific problems, to uh, make it easier to, uh, to find and use that data and to uh, basically help machines understand that data kind of from the get-go. And one thing that I found, and this is something that I think is a question of, is this a special case observation or is this more of a general case principle? Um, do we need so many predicates? Do we need so many properties uh, that we currently have? So something like DBpedia or uh, Wikidata uh, has literally thousands of properties in their ontology, and uh, I think it's continuing to grow every day. Uh, these are not necessarily um, uh, these aren't necessarily um, general purpose uh, predicates. These are things like uh, birth name, birth date, uh, child, uh, parent, uh, spouse. So these are kind of useful for in some things, but uh, there's a question of, should we really be thinking about these things as properties, or is there another way that we should be phrasing them that actually makes, uh, they make more sense? So uh, let's see. Right, so uh, there's a couple of design styles that have been uh, coming about as part of ontology development. Uh, one of them is freeform, right? We just, we need something, we make it, and we don't worry about it. And that's kind of been, to some degree, that's been the approach for a lot of linked data. That's been the approach for DBpedia for many years. Uh, and it's followed through in a lot of other places. Psych uses it, I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly. Uh, Wikidata, as I mentioned, uses it. Uh, basically, if you need a relation between two things, you just make it up. And you hope, you, maybe you search first and find some. Find, see, find to see if there's one already, but most of the time, you know, if there isn't, you just go for go for it. I think Psych has suggested rules for, for how creating. to try to make sure you reuse. Yeah, exactly. You make something. Exactly. But if you can't find it, and right. you follow the rules. Right. Exactly. Can... Yeah, and so um, and so the uh, and actually um, the other place where we see this is in UML. Right, we so UML actually comes from uh, comes from uh, database modeling to a large degree, and so if you had a class uh, like person, you might have uh, first name, last name, uh, date of birth. Right, and each of these 
So this is, you know, this is a U, uh, UML diagram, and each of these things would be a uh, a field, either in the database or in the object model that you're building. And when we map this over into an ontology, um, so remember, what, when you have something like person, you actually have uh, each of these things is it's a property that's associated with person, right? So it's not just first name as like kind of a globally identified thing. It's actually person first name, person last name. So they're, they're scoped by the object that they contain. Uh, that's actually in, in literally in the rules of how you uh, build uh, object-oriented systems. And when you address first name in Java or C++, the first thing you have to do is you have to cast it to person, right? You can't actually refer to this property unless you know that you're talking about a person. Uh, there's some special behind the scenes rules as to why that happens, but that's generally the case. Now, if you were to have, uh, let's say you also had, um, you know, you wanted something a little bit more generic like name, uh, and then you also had organization here. Uh, and then there was, say, name here. There's other stuff, too. So that name in person is like the whole name of that person, like a full name. Yeah, we'll say it's a full name. Display name, whatever you want to call it. It's basically what you might use to show the person in the context of whatever application you're creating. So name and name. So are these the same property? No, they're not. They're, they're very... By this, no. By this, no, they're not. Um, and so we actually have five different properties already, just with the way we're doing this. And, you know, within a database, this might make sense because it's very operationally oriented. It's very uh, data artifact oriented. And so this is probably fine for most relational databases. But the thing is, is that when you try to map this approach over to an ontology, where you might have person and organization and then you might have you know first name last name uh, name And then over here, you might have name. So first off, you need to decide when you're mapping over whether or not these are actually the same thing or not, right? Because the, they're not the same thing in the object model, but maybe they are. Uh, and so you have to decide kind of what your scoping is for a given uh, field name in a, uh, in a particular ontology as you map this over. Uh, but the other thing that maps over is some of the assumptions that people will often make in UML about how these things are built. So, you know, you might want to have named th uh, named thing that's a superclass of organization and person, but you might also want to have, uh, you know, if you had own thing, you wouldn't. Uh, you might have own things with names, own things without names. Organizations are things that are owned by people. And so, therefore, you, you're going to have to introduce multiple inheritance in order to really do that the right way. Um, kind of where, where I'm going with this, though, is that the, uh, the, the approach that you might have to creating a data model and creating uh, a, a ontology and creating properties in an ontology, you have to be very thoughtful about how that turns out. Because the other thing is that in a... Uh, in a UML model, oh, sorry, go ahead. Hmm. Yeah, that's the problem. So, re repeat that. Sorry. So, so uh, Neka asked if, uh, so while technically the name and organization, the name field and organization, the name field in person, are different things because they're on different objects aren't they conceptually the same thing and that's exactly the problem is that they are the same thing conceptually 
and we would want to use the same property for both. But UML, the way it works, unless we make a superclass, and sometimes it doesn't make sense to make those superclasses, uh, if, if we don't make that superclass, they're not going to be the same thing. Uh, they're not going to be conceptually the same or technically the same. And uh, you can't actually uh, drive them together without some sort of without some sort of superclass because every property in a in a object model is associated with a particular class. They're not they just hang out by themselves. In an owl, they do hang out by themselves, right? It's just a URI. And so, um, so sort of, to, I think to get to your point, in order to reflect how the UMList thinks of thinks of these properties, right. you would to, to sort of capture their meaning. Yeah. Um, you would one example might be you're creating four properties: person, person first name, person second name, person date of birth. Person yeah, exactly. Name, to capture the person nameness of that property. Whereas you risk sort of having a simpler approach, saying, I'm just, this is right. going to be a, anything that's in here as a person entity, and I'm just having these properties. And just, right, yeah, exactly. And you, you could very easily, I mean, it might be a modeling error, but it might not be. In one class, you have something with a particular, uh, you know, you might have just name here, or you might have a field, and it's the same field name as something else in another class but the the type for that field will be different and so therefore you're pointing to different things and so how would you resolve that you you have to resolve that by resolving to the class that that it, uh contains it now one thing this is kind of a big reason why i wanted to bring up uml one thing that's really important here is that in a date in a uml data model and I'm going to argue in other kinds of data models. Every single field, every single property on a class has software attached to it that realizes the semantics of that field. You do not get anywhere near any of these without realizing some sort of semantics of the, val of the field or property or whatever you want to call it in the class. And the thing is, is that software is expensive, right? We, we, uh, and ideally, you'd like to be able to handle these in a generic kind of way. And you know, sometimes with, so like with Java, there's introspection. Uh, with uh, Python and JavaScript, there's, it's even more dynamic than that. But the thing is, you're still potentially treating those properties in a very specific way and you're writing software that interprets it in that way. Now, once you get to uh, a ontology, you actually uh, get the same sort of thing. But of course, since you've basically, uh, you can make any URI be any property within reason uh, or within, a, within your namespace scheme or whatever you want to do. You, you still have that problem of every single property is the, the semantics of that property is realized by some software. It could be a Sparkle query. It could be Python, JavaScript, Java, whatever. It could be uh, something that the human, a human is thinking about when they're uh, invoke when they're using that property, but in every single case, there's software associated with it that's special to that property. And the, uh, right. So where I'm going with this is that essentially, when you have a knowledge graph and you say, Let's say, so there's, uh, there's, there's two parts to uh, uh, kind of an ontology. There's the properties and the classes, generally speaking. I mean, there's other stuff too, but those are the big two. And if I, if, you were to, if I were to ask you, where does the semantics of an ontology lie? Where does the semantics of the knowledge graph lie? Does it lie in the properties 
or the classes. So raise your hand if you think it's part uh, if, it, uh, it's for, if, it, if the semantics of a ontology or knowledge graph lie in the classes. Okay, so I see two. And how many of you think that the semantics of the knowledge graph or ontology lie in the properties? <laughs> Uh, one, two, three. Wait, there's, there's, well, so then, then there was there's, a shrug there's, there's, from my architect's brother, who uh, I, I think he was just shrugging well, the whole I time. Think, so I say it's in properties because the properties are the relationships. Yes. Well, there, well, yeah, there, there's a yeah. Questions. So there's there's yeah. So you could have. I didn't say that you had to raise your couldn't raise your hand twice. I just figured. Uh, oh, you did? Okay. Well, I, I figured the talk was about properties. So. Yeah. Well, so so here's the thing. Yeah. So so there's a hint because I, I didn't say careful with that class, Eugene. <laughs> um, but the so the, there is a um, the, so we, we've uh, I've kind of thrown around this this principle. The the meaning of a knowledge graph is in, is encoded encoded in its structure, right? So if I say, um, I give you a knowledge graph where I say, so there's so this gives you some information, right? Let's say we do the same thing, but we invert the meaning of this. And we basically, so we have the identifiers for the nodes, but we lose the, the edges. So we, we know that we have a structure here, right? And we know that we're, John and I are rela related in some in way. some way, yeah. And we have some sort of relationship to person. But th these could all be subclasses that we could each be, so each of those could be classes. Uh, whereas here, we actually have some, some implicit information already. We know that there's, these two things are the same kind of thing and they relate to each other via the, the nose thing. So, I mean, again, this is uh, my own opinion, but I think this one actually has more semantics in it because we've, that's where we've encoded, that's where the structure is, right? If you, if you have a graph without any labels, then there's no meaning there. If, if you have a graph where you maybe have labeled the nodes, all you know is that there's interrelationships. Um, so on this, how much do we know about about those properties, if if we if we know the rules for those properties, we know exactly. The That's right. the thing. We can we can learn from this based on what we know about these properties, and we have if you know we have a little bit of software about what RDF type means. It means that you know if uh, you know if uh, let me do this the right way uh, x. Uh, let's do this way. Pipe. And I'm going to use binary predicate logic for everything because I actually think that unary predicate logic for types is kind of misleading in some ways. Uh, type x, y, x in y, right? So that's, uh, therefore, mm -hmm. that's, the, the, that's the semantics of of type of RDF type, and we uh, we actually write tons of software based on that sem on that semantics. Right, but it's kind of different. So type is a well uh, presumably a primitive. Nose probably isn't. That is true. So we, we can say a, a lot less about that. But what we can do is we can analyze the social network graphs. We can do all sorts of things using that nose relation, even though it's vague and kind of you know kind of hard to interpret but what's going on though is that when you see this you you know what to do right you know how to handle that or to just ignore it 
because it's not interesting to you. If you see this, you actually don't know what edges to handle or to deal with. You don't know what you can add to the uh, to the graph by inference. You don't know what you can um, ignore, what you can what you should focus on. And basically, there's all these sorts of rules. So if you go through the OWL specification, all of the consequences of so subclass of is another one that has very clear semantics like this. The uh, uh, all of the restriction, uh, the owl restriction stuff, that's all defined in terms of the properties. You know, there's union versus uh, intersection, although actually, no, those are those are also properties. Uh, basically, the, the meta classes in owl are um, owl class, owl restriction, uh, uh, data type property and object property and individual and everything else all the real nuts and bolts of a of owl is expressed in the semantics of predicates you know one thing so richard Weiss and i a gazillion years ago right i wrote all the axioms for daml plus oil mm -hmm. and i guess daml um i don't think anybody's done it for owl but it'd be interesting to go back and look at those axioms and see whether essentially the heads are all properties. Mm -hmm. But they were written for the constructors of the language. Right. You know, like disjoint. Yeah. So, yeah. So, the, um... <clears throat> so you know, what's interesting, so. Uh, one of the notions that I wanted to bring up at some point, and this is probably the right point, mm -hmm. is this notion, you know, years ago somebody cautioned me, said, don't, um, this, this notion of ontology hijack, okay? And which is, and, right. and what does that actually mean? And what, what he really meant was he was referring to uh, property hijack, okay? Which is where we go shopping for, a, we, we're told we should, you, Make use, reuse, reuse things, ontology. Yeah. Reuse ontologies, okay. So if you do that, uh, so what does it mean to reuse an ontology wrong, reuse properties wrong? Well, it's actually getting into what is the actual definition of that property from this mm -hmm. perspective. Okay, if I've got foo x, y, right. okay, there's a correct use of that and not correct. And it's not, it doesn't matter what the word is, okay. And what you're getting at, with your first example with the, the names and stuff, it's mm -hmm. gone now, but it, there's a potential to misuse that. There's a potential that by name we meant person name. Okay. Right. right? Yeah. And so there might have been an ontology where you got that from where you it was it meant person name, like right. both name. I think that means person name. Yeah, it does. Okay? Yeah. And I shouldn't name trucks with it. Although people right. do. They say, Oh, I'm supposed to reuse the ontology, so to reuse so that. For, yeah. And I don't and maybe Focus in a simple popular. case, it doesn't matter, but if I've got some reasoning-based application, the cares. Yeah, well, that's deceptive, too, because both, if you understand what it means, friend of a friend, we're assuming it's human. Right, the domain, the that's, domain that's discourse my point. is human. That's exactly. my point. Yeah. So just, or, or, or stealing from Dublin Core because you needed a description, then it's meant to be a described works, and you use it to describe a car. So... But, I, but my, but I, I, I'm just interjecting this now because to me, you're touching on, you know, you're getting to that point. Of what does it mean to potentially hijack something? It's, or right. It means to misuse a property arbitrarily mm -hmm. just because you think it's a word that's applicable when it actually brings long meaning with it. Right, exactly, yeah. And, and the, yeah, and the, uh, so yeah, that's actually kind of the flip side of what I'm trying to get at. So since properties are kind of the consequences of properties are actually kind of expensive, you uh, you do want to make sure you're using the right one. Um, but that's but and the, what's the alternative? The alternative is make up your own and hope for the best and and write your own software. And I'm not going to argue that you shouldn't ever make your own properties because there's many cases where you want to have a very specific thing. Um, especially if you have software hanging off it that you want to work a very specific way. Um, so SCOS notation, I use it all the time, even in situations where I've got, um, where I'm trying to minimize the use of my properties and using something like 
Sio, which has a fixed set that's very generic and very easy to, to reuse, I'll use it because I know that I can rely on a very specific, uh, being used in a very specific way. It's used to, to talk about short symbols to, to do lookups. So things like CM is a notation for centimeter, for example. Um, uh, yeah. So, so you asked the question, if the semantics are in the classes or the properties for knowledge graphs or ontologies, right? And you, you kind of convinced me that they are in the properties for knowledge graphs, but for an ontology, like consider the case where you have a single property in an ontology subclass of, and you have like an ontology, maybe it's not a very um, well-designed ontology, but you can have tons of classes that are hierarchically arranged and there's a lot of semantics there. No, there isn't. There's no semantics. There's very little semantics in a topic, in a hierarchy. Um, right, so so the, the actual, yeah, the actual semantics of it, so the semantics of it is still determined by the subclass of. You know, if you removed subclass of from that hierarchy, all you have is a directed acyclic graph of labeled nodes, and you wouldn't know what the meaning of that graph is. It's subclass of that tells you that you're talking about the relation, interrelationship between classes. And so, okay, so the, um, right, so there's two actually, two pieces to this idea of expensive properties. So there's, um, there's the, uh, the idea, of, there's also the idea of reuse. So in a ontology like SIO, which has a very fixed set of uh, properties and kind of fundamental types that interrelate them. Um, and I'm gonna try to do a little bit of justice here because we're gonna be using some of these as examples in the future, uh, in a little bit. So for instance, you might have, um, you have an entity, uh, entities can have uh, has attribute um, and you have an attribute uh, it can have a unit right well yeah but uh, Everything can have attributes. Attributes can have attributes. Processes can have attributes. So, and yeah, entity is top level. Um, but then, yeah, so objects objects can be participants in processes. Uh, entities can uh, has part. They can uh, be parts of other things. So these are all kind of very generic and reusable. This is SIO. SIO, yeah. Just, could you just mark it up for the benefit of people yeah, so watching? SIO, S-I-O, Semantic Science Integrated Ontology, for those of you who are not. But the thing is that uh, basic formal ontology works in a very similar way. Um, and a lot of other ontologies, PROV actually to some degree does this because it's a very fixed set that is very uh, useful within that scope. Um, what else is there? So, right, so uh, then you have these things called roles, right? And then you might have as role, and you might have something, like the role might be in relation to another entity. So th this is kind of a reusable structure for talking about things in the world and the, you know measurements and attributes and qualities of those things, which would basically be these adder objects, roles in relationship to other entities, and all this other stuff. And you might look at this and say, well, so what? I could just do, you know, subject treat the roles as predicates and just have them be there. And I can just treat these attributes as data type properties and do the same thing and it's not why why are we making all these extra things and i actually used to think that because that that was and this really kind of annoyed me that you know you, you basically have one data type property has value and everything else is an object why would you do that 
Um, they realize why you would do that. Uh, and so part of it actually is, so this structure here is actually super pow powerful when you're actually trying to find a, um, when you're trying to find things in the graph, right? And so if you have uh, a visualization, a query that drives a visualization or a query that drives um, a, uh, some sort of analysis or you're trying to do some sort of consistent grouping, you can write a query to do the, the sort of thing on one knowledge graph that conforms to this and apply it to other knowledge graphs in completely different domains, completely different roles and relationships, completely different attributes, and have it still do some of the same stuff. So could you, to drive home this point, mm -hmm. could you sketch out the alternative, which um, may call it the ad hoc. <laughs> so right, yeah, so yeah. there's a lot of people on the phone who may, or in, even in the room, who may so, have experienced going, instead of has attribute and yeah. you know, that, that it's the temperature attribute and has value, they maybe have has temperature. Yeah, exactly. In fact, so I'm going to use uh, whatever bad example you want to use. Right. So I'm going to start with uh, John Lennon because uh, this is his DBpedia thing is actually suggests some really weird stuff, like the fact that he was a bigamist potentially. So, right. So John Lennon. So for those of you who don't right, be know, be careful now. Yoko's got really good lawyers. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Sorry, Yoko. Uh, his, I'm going to solve the solve their problems. I didn't make those problems. So John Lennon. Right. So the I don't want to call it naive way, but kind of the rough and ready way of representing these things is spouse Yoko Ono. And spouse, um, uh, Cynthia. So, right, so this is how DBpedia has it two triples John Lennon, spouse Yoko Ono, John Lennon, spouse Cynthia Lennon. This you know, th there, th this could mean a bunch of different things. <laughs> this can mean that he was married to Yoko Ono and Cynthia Len Lennon at the same Religion. time. Religion, Mark. Yeah, exactly. There, there, this could. This is this is incredibly ambiguous. But we don't have any temporality. We don't. Right. Exactly. And there's no place for it in here either. Um, and actually, th this is. One thing that uh, in a um, so th this is actually one place where either non-monotonic knowledge graphs have been proposed, where you might you know you might kind of roll through time and this one appears and that one disappears at different points and or uh, you might go from binary predicate logic to entry predicate logic where you have time. Uh, time slots in there. Um, there's all sorts of proposals for how to do this. But the thing is, is that he was a spouse to Yoko Ono and to Cynthia Lennon at different, at, you know, these are both true, just not at the same time. And the thing is, if we say something like, um, you know, spouse uh, John Lennon uh, Yoko Ono, um, I don't even remember, uh, 1969, uh, 1980, right? So we, we expand this into a, 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 a quad spot, a, a quad, uh, quad predicate. So we know what the semantics of these two spots are in, in Predicate logic are right? What are these semantics? Here, yeah. But what about, you know, that's not universal, right? So somewhere else might have something else as these positions in, in those uh, slots. Well, you might have a single thing that's an interval. Right, yeah. You might have a, a length of time. You might have, um, you might have all sorts of things. But, and, and but the thing is, though, is that 
This can keep going forever and ever and ever as you add more details to this relation, right? The other option is that maybe this is a thing that's worth identifying itself, and which is what we do here. We have this role thing, right? So in this case, uh, instead, you would have um, you, you might have a spouse role, let's say, in relation to as role. And then you would do the same thing down here. You would have another spouse role as role in relation to how the Nintendo's role in algebra works. This is how that Yes, this is how we do this is this how, how we do, we do our Because the thing is now that we have spouse roles, we can give it as uh, you know, uh, that's just role. What kind of role? As right. So this is there's an implicit type here. I didn't. Yeah. This actually this is a blank totally node. Uh, 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 this is a blank node of type spouse role. This is a bl another blank node of type spouse role. As attribute. Yep. Uh, so a start time as value uh, 1969. Oh, that was your phone. Oh, right, yeah. But, um, 1982. Oh, it was before your phone. Oh, yeah. So maybe 1945. Yeah. I just got some here. <laughs> <laughs> so now you want to put in that that was said by actually Sabina. yeah well yeah, that's the problem that we, 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 got, yeah, we got this we got. identified so we can say was nano there's a nano publication it was quoted by or something I think it was actually sixty three was attributed yeah yeah I think was sixty three yeah. well, let's go with that I won't blame Severe for that one <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just. 63 was right about when the blissful yeah the okay so <laughs> and yeah so anyway this you're is not nuking the spouse yeah but no i there. haven't um yeah well right so okay. we would do it this way oh. right so so what what have we done here. We've basically taken something that was a very specific one-off predicate, blown it all out of proportion. But the thing is, is that we we kind of need to in order to fill in these details about what this role actually looks like. So rather than going through and continually trying to extend RDF with more and more tuple spots of different kinds of things, we could just use RDF as it was meant with triples. I mean, everything that you have in here, you can express as triples. You just have to add more entities to the graph. But most of these things are entities to some degree already. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking about a scenario about basically um, 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 writing a query for this. Um, Really no, but then you know I do you not know, that. But then um um what does it never all the what does it never all the granularity that um that we know that there is a value in the way in the graph. Right. So how when how do you know when to know, bottom out? Yeah, how do we know right how do we know the position of the highest value? Well, it's on the thing That's that you're looking for. Is, right? Yeah. So she wants to know when, uh, how, how do you know when you're done reifying and making extra stuff? Well, you do it when you're, when you actually reach the, the point that you're identifying. So if you've got a spouse role, if you have things to say about that role, you put them as attributes or roles or whatever else. You know, if it's a part of a larger context, like you, you put that in as statements on this role. If, it's about the pattern before, right? Right. Well, that's the thing is that actually to some degree, we know the pattern. 
overall. We have, we know kind of how all this limited set of relations, the limited set of properties uh, interact with each other, kind of what you're allowed to do. And we can write software that, that specifically reacts to those things. And then we don't, you know, when we go querying for this, we, we not only, if we do, if we did DBpedia this way, not only would we know, be able to know that, uh, you know, basically he was married to Cynthia Lennon, Yoko Ono at different times, and they had these roles, but we can also flip it around and say, well, what other kinds of roles did he have? He was a singer-songwriter in the Beatles. He was, uh, you know, he was involved with certain nonprofits. He this and that and the other thing, and they're all subclasses of role, right? And so, if we're if we know what this means, we can figure out what these are. It's so just to, to sort of reaffirm um, in in this use case, you can have a relatively simple query that's asking who who was John Lennon's spouse at this right. time. Yeah, okay. exactly. And who and and you 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 get the appropriate different answer on the Telos World portal. Um, we've got this all over the place with group membership, project membership, uh, roles played in off, you know, and it's, 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 if you, if you are probing around at a very low level, it is a kind of a challenge, but at the same time, it, it allows when it's done right. And when the instances, when the instance graph is done right, it allows some very elegant queries because you get appropriately set. So do we have temporality? Like Joy yeah, yeah, do. is still showing well, up as that's an API on right. So no one updated it. Well, yeah. So, no one updated so it. that that so this is like and I so the I indicator that update. So so the well yeah, so the um, that's a situation where that temporality wasn't properly completed. So that those boundaries weren't weren't uh, properly set. Um, it's it's our ontology that powers the Tillis World Portal is set up with this in mind. Okay. Yeah. And it's and it's it's all over the place and it's um it's it's pretty elegant. If you look at it at a low level, because there's a lot of B graphs and B notes and stuff yeah. like that, it's kind of scary. But when you look at the queries that are powering it, it's actually pretty uh, pretty elegant because it's trying to say it's trying to not worry about these different things. It's trying to do it in a yeah. in a nice exactly. high level way. Okay. Um, so, right. Uh, and so it's just I just mentioned that as a, as another application, and, right. and how doing the alternative is it's kind of a mess. Yeah, exactly. And this, <coughs> you know, kind of visually it might look more intimidating than what I had on before because it was a very simple ABC type of thing, but it really wasn't telling us the whole picture, and it was potentially misleading as well. Um, so there, there's one other thing that I want to kind of underline here. And that's this idea of, oh, sorry, go ahead, Becca. Repeat her question. Oh, so, so she's, yeah, so she's asking, what if, you, what if you're reusing an ontology and they don't have this structure? Well, so um, I'm not saying you have to use this structure. I'm saying this is a really valuable structure to use. So if you are using an ontology where they're doing something else and it's not getting in your way and there's no reason to translate it to something like this, then don't keep reusing it because you're going to, you're just going to need to write software for their predicates. Uh, and the, if you're writing your own thing or if you've come across limitations for it, I would recommend switching over to a system like this because you'll be able to, uh, you know, the software that you do write will be much more straightforward. You can apply and reuse software from other contexts to to your uh, to the knowledge that you're producing. This example, is SIO. What's that? Why? Why is it? Yeah. So why do I keep talking about SIO? So we, I've been using SIO since about 2012. 2013. I started using it to talk about the um, relationships between uh, proteins and uh, drugs and proteins and diseases. 
and talk about their interactions and be able to model that. It's really cool, really useful. And I started getting it into the uh, kind of a, the attribute area, and this actually started uh, at a external project that I was working on, where I needed to kind of represent in a generic way a bunch of uh, qualities and gene expression values and all this other stuff. But I wanted it structured in a way where I can basically visualize over it, no matter where it came from. Because it was coming from five different parts of a database using five different queries to produce these different tables. And some of them need to be really deep and detailed. Some of them were very shallow. And I needed to just kind of square it away. And so I applied this approach of having entities with attributes uh, and uh, units of measure. And also, uh, I'm not showing here, but there's uh, temporality in here. Temporality was actually a big problem with this project. It was not being addressed. I put that all in, and I was able to uh, have it uh, map over into some visualizations and some queries. And it worked. And it worked really well. And I, and I looked at it some more and I said, this is actually pretty broadly applicable. I think that we can use this for other things. So uh, basically, the first few projects that I was involved with in uh, Tableau after I uh, joined the staff, I kind of advocated for trying this out and see how far we got. And uh, it's been five or six different projects in many different unrelated domains, uh, you know, uh, uh, what child, was first? I can't remember. What was the, the Healthy Birth Growth okay. and Development. HPGD KI. KI, sorry, yes. <laughs> yeah. KI was yeah, knowledge integration, integration. <laughs> which is what, what we're doing. Um, and then there was another childhood health one, and uh, Cheer, and then uh, then we started doing Nanomine, which is a nanomaterials knowledge graph, and then we were doing uh, dynamic spectrum work, uh, policy graphs, and Repurposing drugs. Yeah, repurposing drugs, which I mentioned at the beginning. And then there's like all these other things. And now we've got these other ones with uh, IBM yeah. and Heels. And we have like five different project, mini projects within that that are able to talk to each other because they're all kind of using the same approach. And so they can reuse each other's data. They can reuse each other's tools. Um, and it just kind of keeps working. and. Uh, at one point, I laid, up, laid down the law and I said, if you're going to make a new property, you have, I have to approve it. <laughs> and I haven't heard a thing. <laughs> um, of course, they might be making them. They might be just scared. <laughs> yeah, they might, I just scared them off. But um, they just don't make but, any problems. Yeah, they're just not. They're just not um, or the, uh, yeah. Or the making them, then we don't know. Right, exactly. Uh, but uh, but my, I tried to focus on it said, try to find a way to fit it in here because I think there's a place for it. And if you're going to find something that's that's new, that's exciting, but I, we need to justify it. And um, I haven't heard as much about making new stuff since then uh, in terms of properties. Um, but the thing that, and so kind of what I really want to think of, kind of emphasize is the idea that properties, so if you think about uh, this as a programming language, right? You're, you're writing, to some degree, you're writing software because you're writing a declarative description of how things interrelate. And if you're talking about these things like properties, you know, kind of the, the format of predicate logic, the fact that you've got this thing here in the parentheses and a, 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 a tuple of, um, of values, what does that look like? That looks like a, a function, right? And so in in software, we write functions all the time. It's just it's function, function, function. Especially in R. Yeah, well, most in most uh, most software. But in particular R. Yeah. <laughs> but the um, but I want to I want you to think about this in a slightly different way, especially if we're only going to be thinking about binary predicates. Yeah. What, so the, um, in programming languages, there's something else that, there's a binary thing that's in programming languages that is similar to a, a function, but not quite. Uh, and 
Is anyone my being too obscure with us? Probably. Probably operators. Plus minus oh, divide. Oh, oh, right. right, 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 right. I would like to propose that we start thinking about properties not as functions, but as operators. So as, a, as you would think of an operator in a programming language. With a function, you just write functions. You need a new function, you write it, and it's done. And you're not going to alter the semantics of a programming language by introducing a new function. If you introduce a new operator, you're going to vastly change the semantics of a programming language. So huge consequences all over the place. So it's kind of like constructors in a language, like owl or devil or something. So you know, there's a fixed set yes. of primitive language constructs. Yes, yeah. exactly. And I think that I think we should be thinking of properties as that kind of fixed set of of, of constructs. And when we think about designing an ontology, we, we should be thinking very carefully about the predicates that we use and the properties that we add, because they're going to have huge consequences to how we structure our knowledge. And they're going to have huge consequences about the kind of software we have to write to react to that knowledge. So if we keep it limited, if we keep it to, to a set of known primitives, like what you're saying here, yes. then we already are there. Yes, exactly. So, um, and I'm not, again, I'm not saying that these are the right primitives or that we, there's even a limited set of primitives. What I'm saying is that when you're, if you're writing a, an ontology, to some degree you're writing a language. If you're thinking about the, the, these, relate, uh, these properties as operators, those oper so in a programming language, the operators define the semantics of the language. In a knowledge graph, the properties define the semantics of the language you're using to express the knowledge graph. Can I make an observation in particular about what you've got here for yeah. style? And, and this is kind of from a data analytics standpoint. Okay. Is what, you've, what you're doing here is you're essentially building the documentation into the, um, or the, if you want the data dictionary, into the graph, okay? So right. when I'm doing analytics, I you know I've got a thing, or maybe it's an observation. Okay, I've got an observation. I've got a number of, of variables that I'm observing, and I need to know what my units are for mm -hmm. those. Right? Yeah. Okay. And so if if I've got if I've got it done in this fashion, okay, I've got a bunch of attributes. Okay, so my obs I've got my observation. Let's just call that the entity. Now I've got a bunch of attributes of that. My measurements. I need to know each of those. I need to know what those units are to, for yeah. the, you know, even, I, I, yeah, I have to they know, I have run, to know, yeah. are they, are they numerical? Are they factors? Are they what? Are they Boolean? I need to know that. And I, from this, I have a consistent way that I can get that. I can get to know exactly what, what that attribute is. I can get to know what my, um, each of my units. So I've got it all there in a consistent way. I can rip that out. Um, conversely, if I've got it, if I've got it like has temp, which is just a word, okay? Mm -hmm. and how do I know what the units are for? Right. Well, it's not even time? a word. It's not even a word. It's a it's a URI. Right. It's just a blip. Okay. Yeah. And maybe if I'm lucky, maybe I can resolve that and get some definitions somehow. Right. But I've, but but this gives me all of that. I'm I'm exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm rehearsing this because I want to emphasize to people, who might be creating scientific uh, <laughs> knowledge graphs on the or a watch on a phone, mm -hmm. why this is wicked important. Yeah. You get a lot of stuff for free here. You get a, a reflection, basically. Exactly, yeah. You, you can discover your graph right. if you're using this approach. Right. Well, and I was trying to... I'm yeah, sorry, I, 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 I think through the... Did you saw it? Um, I asked you. Oh, okay. So she was just wondering how um, if it has values, the only data type property, how do you infer the data type of actual values? And my answer was then you, you just look at what attribute has After that value and what's the type of that. Right. So if you have a, for instance, if you have a date time object, you might say that the, um, the, the, val the has value of a date time object can only be XSD date time. So you can you can have property restrictions down at that level right. on your thing, 
to, to uh, and actually it's not enforcement. It's not enforcement. It's, uh, it's informational. You might, yeah. Yeah, other questions. You had a question. I did, but you can go in and I ask. I also have a question. Yes. So I was trying to search this and I haven't come up with it, but I've heard in the last week um, of some knowledge graphing resource that will let you make new classes, that will let you make new individuals, but won't let you make new properties. Mm -hmm. But I can't find it and I can't remember where. I've been doing all this homework for this knowledge graph talk. Yeah. And I think it was in, actually, it might have been one of the blog posts from the workshop that we went to. Oh, maybe one. Maybe I should go look at his post. One would have let you make property. Yeah, not his <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I, I've been I'm trying to figure out where I yeah, read that. But I read it in the last one. week. Okay, yeah. That would be okay. interesting. So you don't know about this thing? No, I don't. Uh, it's something that I've been sorely tempted to do with why is because it would save me a lot of trouble. But it's not. Um, but I'm trying to keep it uh, vocabulary agnostic as much as possible. So, um, you know, if you don't, if you're not using SIO, that should be fine for you to keep, you know, we're not going to really want to go that way. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, so, um, oh, yeah, Neha next. So you started the talk by saying that you want to reduce the number of properties, right? Oh, yeah. Found it. Wikidata. Yeah. Oh, Wikidata. So no, yeah, they you can first. you can make new properties in Wiki. Wikidata well, has he thousands. Well, chatting with Lydia Pitchner and learning how Wikidata really works. It's an interesting mix of tech and community. For example, users can create classes and instances, but cannot create properties. If they need, they believe they need to do it, it has to go through a community process. Well, that's good, um, but they still have thousands of properties. Well, okay, <laughs> but there's some. But there yeah, is a process. I guess it's a I guess it's so, a start. What they're doing is they're kind of echoing schema.org, which you were going to rant about. Right. Well, schema.org also has thousands of properties. It's, it's still very ad hoc in there. Uh, and there's. But um, it's a community process. Right. Well, so here's the thing. So as I was saying, every property has a cost, right? You have to write software to handle that property. Yes. The companies that are working behind schema.org have a lot of resources to write software. And so they're more than happy to just write custom software because that's that's okay for them. But to be clear, the reason that schema.org exists is to bound that. Okay. So right. so they so when in 2011 when they created schema.org, a lot of people said, why don't we just use RDFA? We've already done this, it's RDFA. Yeah. And the answer to the question is well, Google et al. can't like understand every single potential attribute right. that gets created. However, if we bound it yes. by schema.org vocabularies, and they guarantee if it's in a public, if what they call published, published vocabulary under schema.org, um, then they guarantee that they'll index that. Right. So it's a and, and then they put their re infinite resources on. Right. It. That's it's why they have that. thousands instead but of only that. millions. Yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So the yeah they they can afford to have more and they are trying to have more than or less than infinity. That's right. <laughs> so yeah. So you started by saying that we should reduce the number of properties efficiently. Yes, or at least minimize the number that we create. So, uh, by the method that you propose, aren't we increasing the number of properties? We're limited in the number of no. distinct properties. It's like side properties. It's not so, the absolute number. It's right, not the number of instances. Right. It's the number so, we're, of... we're not, um, when, when you use this and you maybe you have a new role to, to introduce, those aren't properties, those are classes. And classes are fine. Classes can be defined in terms of properties, right? But if you have lot, if you keep adding new properties, there's the other thing is that in OWL, the the facility for defining classes formally is very uh, very powerful as far as these things go. But they're all based on properties, and then properties there are certain kind of attributes like whether or not it's transitive, reflexive, so forth. But then there's like um, well, actually, domain and range is actually about classes too. Uh, and then there's sub properties, uh, relations, and then there's the 
object property, data property split. That's it. There's like nothing in there that actually explains the semantics of any given property. You have to read it. You have to read the, the RDFS comment, the label, and see what they mean by it and interpret it and figure out what you're going to do with it. And then you write the software that actually handles that property. So, um, so that's why classes are cheaper than properties because you can define classes in terms of properties. Right. There's nothing you can define a property in terms of. And in that same vein, um, introducing more properties um, introduces more misinterpretation. It could, yeah. Because um, then there's more things to interpret. Right. And, and the, yeah, and the thing is, once you build a consensus around how some fundamental property should be used, then it becomes easier to, you know, you, you've kind of built a community, a, a consensus of use in addition to a consensus of, of uh, interpretation. Sorry, did you say you can't define a property in a, uh, in a class? So what about domain and range? So I'm going to define domain, my properties. Domain and range. Uh, With domain and range, I'm going to have classes. Right. It, it, sa it says that uh, all it says is that uh, class membership includes things that have includes the domain of this property and the range of that property. It doesn't necessarily change the semantics of those properties. It just limits the scope. Of yeah, limits the scope. Well, okay, so that's some aspect of the definition. Could be, but it's actually um, so. It's not. Um, yeah, you, you you can you can say that that might be part of it, but the uh, it's it's also retrospective. You know, if you make the statement. You're, uh, you're not saying that anything, once you've made the statement, you've made the statement, right? And then a domain and range will tell you whether or not um, the things in that statement are of a particular type. So it will, it's a way of defining sufficient conditions for membership in a class is the use of that property. Right, but the domain and range are limiting the way things can be connected by that property. No, it doesn't. You can, you're not limiting anything. You, you can make, uh, all it's doing is it's giving a consequent of being used in the domain or range of the property. So you can't say, if uh, I'm not a person, or, you know, if, if you say, uh, so the consequence of saying this has a fofth name isn't the RDF graph being inconsistent. It's that this is a person. It, the, the, the conclusion of fof, fof name uh, RDFS uh, domain person is that anything to use it on is a person. If you use it on this, it's a person. And that's not changing, the, uh, that's not limiting the semantics of, of both name. It's changing, it's, it's, it, well, it's, it's basically defining sufficient conditions for membership in a class. But if I said that the domain was person, yeah. and I used name on a chair, and I knew the chair was disjoint from person. The both name is Right, but the thing is that you, so you, first off, you would need that disjointness. Yeah. But also, the disjointness, uh, so, so I mean, the disjointness is about consistency. It's not necessarily about, um, so you're not, uh, you're not necessarily invalidating it. You're basically saying this is, this is an inconsistent graph. And yeah, so, well, I'm saying that name but, got used improperly. Yeah. So the name of this chair. Right. It was Deborah's chair. Um, but name had to be used on a person because the domain of name was a person. Right. But that's still not, that's part of the semantics of person, not the semantics of both name. I mean, um, maybe, but the, I, I, I think that it's. So I generally That's, like where you're going with this, yeah. but I think you're pushing it further than that could be. makes 
You're going to hear about that resistance. predicate. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> be careful with that predicate right. talk, you know. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so okay, we're, so we're so over an hour. Is there anything that you else that you wanted to? Well, so, yeah. So I guess the, so how do we actually handle some of this stuff? So I showed some examples here with Yoko Ono is that if, if you're, if you really need to fix up something like, um, like DVpedia, uh, so if you have a fundamental set of relations that you're working with, you can basically identify which relations in the graph correspond to things that you actually want to, to uh, represent directly. And then you can basically reify statements as either roles for object properties or uh, attributes for data type properties. Uh, and then you actually get kind of something that you can build off of more, uh, more cleanly. So this is actually related to the question I was going to ask, which is, is explain why this actually isn't any harder to do if you're if you're creating knowledge graphs from from databases or tables right. or whatever. Yeah, it's there might be there, there, a there's some there's some mechanical we, things you could do to to kind of enable this sort of approach. Yes. Well, but it's it's not it's not going to be harder really. You know, if you think of like a a conversion script, like a settler script or something like that. It's not harder to to treat it this way, like right. to do a, to convert scientific data using into using SIO. Exactly, it's not going to be harder than if you just have an ad, ad hocracy created from your column names. Right, exactly. Yeah, um, and yeah, and the important thing is to kind of know what your starting point is, and then you know basically try to rescue the predicates that you like, essentially. Um, the other thing, the other thing could, that I could propose is the idea of maybe, and this is kind of going against what I was saying before, but um, so this is also a problem that uh, Sayo has because Sayo disagrees with some fundamental ideas about reality from BFO, and they both disagree with HL7, and they disagree with Sumo and Dolce, and basically everyone's off in their own worlds, but to some degree. Isn't is there a fundamental set of relations that all those ontologies are using, but they're they might be uh, so in some cases they might be putting more strict uh, domains and ranges on them. They might be saying that this is only uh, you know this is in this situation, but part of is and in fact that was part of the original discussion around owl is should part of be part of owl there's more to it than that there's all these other follow-up uh, this follow-up talk yeah it should <laughs> part of be part of owl. Um, but so you know if we do a fundamental relations ontology we could potentially pull out a whole bunch of relations from many different ontologies and basically let all of these ontologies use the same relations talk about their classes whatever way they want and have whatever perspective they like but still be talking about the same kinds of relations, because mostly they are. You know that the relation ontology exists in the Opal Foundry, right? Yes, and it's been superseded by BFO, and uh, yeah, they, they, they like their... Uh, you know, they, I they think BFO is a great, uh, that's a great acronym for an ontology. It is, yeah. <laughs> it's a great acronym. It's a great that's acronym. It's got some issues. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everything's got some issues. Yeah, but yeah. it's a great but yeah, so, I, mean, so I think you should I'm, I'm kind of, Yeah, so anyway, that, yeah, so the, the uh, I mean, I, I, what I was originally suggesting that, you know, no, we don't need the universal set of relations or closed set of relations, but we could find some benefit in maybe having some fundamental relations that we try to reuse between ontologies. Right, so let's thank Jim. <laughs>